I'm Amanda French, and I'm a recent graduate of the Biodesign Fellowship. And as Emily mentioned, I'm joined by Katie, Rush, and Jonathan. So we thought, we thought we'd start by having everyone introduce themselves and tell a bit more about their experience with the fellowship, um, and then turn it over for questions. So um, Rush, do you want to start by introducing yourself? Hi, I'm uh, Rush Bartlett. I am an uh, engineer by trade. Um, and uh, before the fellowship was uh, in a startup, and then after the fellowship, um, went to um, start two more companies and uh, still running one of those and the other one was sold. Great, and then Katie? Hi, I'm Katie Olson. Uh, my background's also in engineering, so biomedical engineering. Um, before biodesign, I had also started a company um, and previously worked in R&D and in business development for a small uh, product development company. And then after the fellowship, um, I moved into product marketing, and I've been at Stryker Neurovascular, so very large company, and most recently I joined Citerix Orthopedics, which is a startup company also in marketing. Great, and then Jonathan? So I'm Jonathan Schwartz. I have a degree in biomedical engineering. I'm now just finishing my interventional cardiology fellowship. Uh, I worked briefly for Medtronic somewhere around along all that training. Uh, and now I don't have time really for my own company, but I've done some consulting over the past couple of years. Um, great. And then I'm Amanda, as I mentioned, I just finished the fellowship. My degree is in mechanical engineering. So prior to biodesign, I worked in industry at Edwards Life Sciences and then Earlens as an R&D engineer. Um, and now I'm at biodesign finishing up. I graduated, but there's a summer extension phase of the program. So I'm staying on campus working in the summer extension now. Um, and so I thought we would just start by um, turning it back to our alum for some questions about our own experience. And then please type questions as we're talking as um, questions come up. Um, but first, we just all wanted to share our own decision to apply to fellowship and how we decided to apply to the fellowship. Um, and so, Katie, maybe you could start by sharing how did you decide that this was the right time to apply to fellowship when you did, and what was that experience like? Yeah, um, so I had actually been kind of watching the fellowship from afar um, and had known one of the alumni um, of the fellowship. Um, and when I was working on my startup, um, I realized that there were a number of things that uh, I wish I had known at the beginning and I probably could have filtered for. Um, and as I was making the decision on what to do with that company, um, I kind of had a timeline and then was looking at what to do after that timeline. So it was a good timing for me to apply. And then Jonathan, what about you? You're uh, muted. Uh, so I originally applied to the Stanford Cardiology Fellowship knowing about biodesign and was interested in it. And it, they're very flexible about working biodesign into training. So no matter what uh, program you're in at Stanford, they are pretty flexible with letting you fit biodesign in there somewhere, either in place of a research year or in addition to your training that you would do normally. And then can you share a bit more about after biodesign that you went back to fellowship and kind of what your experience was transitioning back into, um, into your cardiology career after biodesign? Sure, yeah. So during my biodesign year, I still had some clinical responsibilities, minimal. It was like one clinic day a week and then some teaching. Uh, so I kept my hand in it. This year was all this year. clinical work. Uh, and uh, I and tried to stay involved in biodesign as much as I can. It's not as much as I'd like. Uh, the uh, eventual the plan, eventual is plan is to all my training and get back into the startup world, the startup world and continue the biodesign process. The biodesign process. Great, and then what about you, Rush? How did you decide to apply to biodesign? How did you find this was the right time for you? Um, so I actually uh, so find actually actually biodesign 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 programs. programs. And, uh, and I don't uh, know if you can uh, mute uh, while we're talking. I think it'll kill the echo. Um, and uh, I found the biodesign program as I was coming out of a bachelor's in chemical engineering at Texas and always wanted to go into the medical field and said, hey, this looks awesome. It's one year, it's paid, and I don't have to take any classes to go play and have fun in the startup community of Silicon Valley. 
Uh, then I, I looked at the resumes of the people that were in the program and I said, wow, with, a, with a sort of an average GPA from a, a pretty good school uh, and only a bachelor's degree, there's no way I'm getting in. Uh, and then I spent the next uh, four years going to graduate school for a, a PhD and an MBA to really just pad my resume to get into biodesign. And uh, um, at the end of that, though, I I'd had a startup company and had a lot of experience, um, which then became extremely valuable uh, once I was in the program to, to eventually launch two more companies out of, out of the fellowship. But it was uh, by far the biggest single thing uh, so far in my career that's, that's launched it forward. Great, thanks for sharing about that. Um, I think the other thing I wanted everyone to comment on is some of the highlights of the fellowship experience. So we can go around the room again, starting with Katie, and um, if you can share highlights and also some of the challenges that you weren't expecting from biodesign. Yeah, um, you know, I think the highlights are, you know, you get such an exposure to such a great network, um, both the people that are in your fellowship as well as um, all of the faculty, all of the people within the Bay Area, there's just such an exposure to a wide range of people um, that it's, it's really easy to get in front of while you're in the fellowship year. Um, and it's just an amazing opportunity. Um, as far as some of the challenges, um, you know, there, it's a lot of kind of personal time with a small group of people, um, which is both fun and then also, you know, kind of helps you to learn a lot about yourself and kind of where you fit into a team, much more so than, you know, when you're working in a larger company and there's structure around it. Um, so that at times can be one of the most fun parts of the program, but then at times can also be one of the more challenging ones. And what about um, you, Rush? What was your perspective there on the highlights and lowlights of being in biodesign? Um, I, I sort of echo Katie's that, uh, you know, teamwork in a flat structure is both very challenging and very rewarding. Uh, but I'd say, you know, just, you know, being at Stanford by itself is, is really a, uh, a blessing and a treat. Uh, but uh, biodesign takes everything there is to ask for a, about Silicon Valley, especially the healthcare ecosystem, which is very small, and sandwiches it into a year and that forces it down your throat. And if you, if you don't love healthcare technology by the end of it, there's, there's something wrong with you because it's, you're, you're just exposed to so many wonderful people and new experiences. And as, um, you know, as an engineer, getting to go in and, and follow guys like Jonathan around and see what happens for real in healthcare as opposed to just talking about it theoretically is, was probably the biggest thing that I personally got out of the program. Um, but my uh, my business partner and co-fellow uh, was a physician, and, and he would say the same thing, but about the business experience and the engineering experience. So uh, the big benefit of the program is learning from people at the top of their field who are completely different than you and uh, growing together as, as uh, team members. That's great. And Rush, can you elaborate on that a bit more, maybe by sharing the companies that you founded out of the fellowship? And um, they're so different from what your original background was. So it would be interesting to hear some comments on how your career evolved because of it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of seeing some of the questions come in. And, uh, you know, my, my background was, you know, chemical engineer, pure like refinery kind of guy. And uh, um, came to the fellowship with, with sort of a business and pharma background uh, after working on a, a drug company um, and going through the fellowship program and really dedicating myself to the biodesign process, uh, two needs popped out. One in the ICU where uh, patients who were ventilated were uh, overly sedated uh, as a result of their having an endotracheal tube shoved down their throat. And uh, we uh, essentially developed an epidural for the upper airway to numb the throat so that that uh, patient's sedation level can be reduced and the delirium and, and side effects from that sedation can be uh, minimized. And that, that product was uh, picked up by Cook Medical about two and a half years after the program, which was um, not, not typical, uh, but it was a nice little win nonetheless. And then the other program, uh, the other company that came out of the Biodesign program our year uh, was a company called Vinca, which is a medical record interoperability play for patients at the end of life to have their 
advanced directive, pulsed form, DNR form available in an emergency so their uh, healthcare wishes can be honored, which uh, improves the quality of care and reduces costs for the health system. And that, that company has uh, just received about $7 million in venture funding so far. Great, thanks for sharing that. And then um, Jonathan, what about you? You bring a completely different perspective having come to biodesign as a physician. So what were the highlights and lowlights of going through the program as a doctor? Um, and what was different from what you were expecting? Yeah, so I think Rush touched on a little bit talking about his partner, the physician. Uh, I really came in with not much knowledge of the whole business world and VC and all that. And so being exposed to it was incredible. And not only that, but it's some of the top groups in the whole area and in med tech in general. So that's been great. The network is incredible. Even being a physician, it was great to have access to the uh, Stanford Medical Center just because pretty much whatever you're interested in, it's, it's done at Stanford or they can connect you with someone that's doing that. Uh, and having team members that weren't physicians kind of helped me see things in a different light and maybe find some needs that I might have missed otherwise. Um, the downside I would say maybe is uh, uh, I was definitely less knowledgeable about some of the business things than my teammates. So I felt kind of stupid at times, but you know, you pick it up quickly, what you need to know at least, and they also can fill in the gaps for you. Um, it is a, a lot of work, but you know, we're kind of used to that as physicians in training. So that part wasn't too bad, but, uh, and surprises, I think, uh, it's, it's incredible how much of a family this is. Once you're in, I'm still getting emails almost every day from someone in biodesign asking me either if I'm interested or if I can help them, or if, if I need any help with anything, people are more than willing to jump out there and just get right in and do whatever it is you need to do. So I'll pause for a housekeeping thing, which is to ask, rather than using the chat bar, if um, participants can put their questions in the Q&A, that enables us to keep easier track and make sure that we're addressing them and marking them when we address them. Um, and then we will get to those questions in about 10 minutes. So um, you can you know, put more then, and in the meantime, that's why we're not getting to them, but we'll get there soon. Um, the third area that I wanted to explore with the alum is, you know, how career aspirations changed before and after the fellowship. Katie, you had mentioned how you felt like there were a lot of things in your early career that biodesign could help you learn and prepare you for. Um, has your trajectory gone as you expected following biodesign or if not, how has it changed? Yeah, um, when I originally applied to biodesign, I fully intended to start another company. Um, and going through the biodesign process was a really great experience to get another iteration on doing the innovation process um, and thinking about, you know, what, what would be the aspects of a good kind of company idea. Um, but going through it, I also realized that I didn't have as much background on the more kind of tactical execution and wanted to go into the business side. But it's hard to be on the business side having not gone through um, product launches, as well as really seeing what it, what it requires for a sales force to be effective. Um, and so since then, I joined a larger company to see kind of a built out um, sales and marketing infrastructure. And, and that was at Stryker Neurovascular. Um, and then kind of took that experience uh, to the startup that I'm currently at, which is uh, Soterics Orthopedics. Um, and my role here is a little bit of sales operations, as well as more tra traditional product marketing. Great. Um, what about you, Jonathan? Did Biodesign change any of the medical track that you were planning on? Mm, no, honestly, no. Uh, the plan all along was to uh, continue clinical work and kind of similar to the, to the fellowship director, Todd Brinton, I want to always have some hand in clinical and then have some hand in startup life and biotech. So this just kind of helped me reach that a little bit easier. And I think that's a really important point that for some people you come to biodesign and you're totally surprised by where it takes you. And for others, it's just, you know, complements what your career plan is. And I think it can be helpful really in both of those scenarios. Um, we'll switch now to catch up on some of the unaddressed questions from the previous webinar for those of you who are able to see Todd. Um, we wanted to catch up on the ones that we saw coming up a lot that weren't answered, and then we will start to answer those that are coming in now. 
So the first unaddressed question from the previous webinar was, is there more of a focus on medical devices versus software and mobile applications? Um, and Rush, I thought you could speak to that given that you ended up starting companies really in both sectors. So um, uh, biodesign is, is really a, a pure art of identifying the most worthwhile unmet clinical need and the best solution to solve that need. And it could be a solution that is in the pharma space, it could be a device, uh, it could be a software technology, or it could even be a service that has no uh, intellectual property with it. Um, Biodesign doesn't really care about what the solution is. Um, in fact, for the first three to four months of the program, they will uh, you know, force you not to invent, which is, I think, a phenomenal uh, advantage uh, to coming to the program and learning how to do that. So it doesn't matter if you come up with, there's been uh, fellows companies in the software space, vice space. Uh, one guy in my year has a, a drug company that's raised about $50 million called uh, Simic Biomedical. So it, it's all over the board. It's all dependent on what the best solution is for that need. Um, great. The next question was, for those applying with an MD, how much experience in engineering and biodesign is needed, and where do they contribute most in the process of innovation? So, Jonathan, if you could start sharing the physician perspective, and then we'll also have Katie answer from how she thought the MDs contributed most. Um, well, I'm a little biased, <laughs> I think. Um, obviously, the biggest role that we play is during the need finding, uh, particularly if you're on a team that has someone at Stanford, uh, it's, uh, you get connected to pretty much all, all, everyone in the hospital. So whatever the uh, field is that your team is interested in, most likely that person will know someone. If not, uh, you know, having Todd with uh, clinical responsibilities at Stanford, he can connect you with pretty much anyone as well. Um, and then after you find your needs and you need to do your deep dives and do a little more research, usually the physicians can kind of help guide that a little bit. Uh, so it's more focused and you're not off doing research on things that maybe aren't quite as related. But I think obviously the clinical part is really where the physicians shine on the team. And Katie, what about you? What's your opinion there? Yeah, I agree. Um, the physicians play like a critical role in the needs finding process. Um, but also throughout the brainstorming, um, it's a, a whole different perspective when um, they just have that vast medical knowledge of the human body, as well as, you know, other, other devices and spaces that we might not be familiar with. So they have a lot of exposure to just medicine in general, um, and also can be very, very creative thinkers, um, and can think about a principle that's applied in some part of the body that can then be brought into another part of the body, um, which I would never have thought of. Um, so I think they play a, a critical role kind of throughout the entire process. Um, but definitely a lot on the front end. Great, thank you. Um, the next question was, how is the interaction between mentors and innovators after the program in the case that the fellowship results into a startup? So Rush, you started talking about that, but if you could share a bit more about the interactions that have been the most helpful, I think that would be great. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Um, uh, I get a lot of advice and help from a variety of different faculty members uh, within the program and also the uh, network outside of the program from, you know, 2013 when I graduated all the way till now. Um, you know, advice from Paul Yock about, you know, personal and professional uh, questions. Uh, one of the biodesign faculty is a board member in our company. Uh, and then many of the biodesign uh, fellow alums uh, are either employees or collaborators on a variety of different projects. It's, it's really, as Jonathan mentioned, a family uh, and everybody watches out for each other and not just within the Bay Area, uh, even uh, beyond the barrier. Sounds good. Does anyone else wanna chime in on how they think the network of biodesign has helped their careers after graduating? 
maybe Katie? Sure. Um, I know that uh, there's, once you're kind of tapped into the bio design network, especially in the Bay Area, but as Rush mentioned, outside of the Bay Area as well, um, you know, bio design is really connected with a lot of the large companies and a lot of the startups um, that are out there. So it's a good way to kind of get a, a little bit of kind of insider understanding if you're thinking about going to a company or potentially getting connected um, with a, a larger company that may want to bring some of that bio design innovative thinking into their company as well. Um, so it's, you know, there's a lot of kind of career decisions and, um, that the faculty is incredibly helpful with, as well as some of the mentors throughout the program. Um, I know I'm still in touch with my alumni buddy from when we actually got started. We get hooked up with someone else in the alumni, um, in the alumni group. And then, you know, really you end up seeing the uh, alumni from biodesign all the time um, and talking about careers and, and hearing a lot of different opportunities. Um, because of those interactions, so. Sounds good. I think we will now transition into questions that are coming in from the audience. Um, so everyone who's listening, please keep sharing your questions in the Q&A and we'll try to address as many as we can over the next 40 minutes. Um, the first one that I'll start with is really around the beginning. People asked, how do you get put into teams? Does every team get an MD? Um, so, Katie, if you can share a bit about the background and how they form the teams and what the general structure tends to be, that would be great. Yeah, um, every team does get an MD, um, sometimes more than one, and then you typically have um, engineers on the team as well as someone that has um, some kind of business experience. They may have been a product manager or in sales or in marketing or have started a company um, previously, so they try to kind of divide people by their experiences. Um, and they also try to divide people by their, their personalities a little bit. Um, you know, it's good to have people who kind of do their own thinking as well as people who can kind of build off of one another. Um, and there's a really important role for kind of everyone who thinks differently. So they try to put the personalities together, um, you know, uh, that are a little bit different as well as um, the backgrounds. Thanks. Um, another question was, somebody asked, can you work and join the program at the same time? Um, Jonathan, can you share that answer with the group? Yeah, so I think I wrote a text answer, so if anyone misses it, it's there, but uh, there really is not time for that. Uh, I think you, you, and you, you won't get as much out of the program if you're not fully dedicated to it while you're there. There are a couple special uh, fellows that are still involved in some clinical work at Stanford, but it's pretty minimal. It's usually just a few hours a week. So pretty much everyone that's in the fellowship is there 100%. Thanks. Um, another question was, can you tell us what happens with IP created during the fellowship? Rush, could you comment on that? Um, so all intellectual property uh, invented with Stanford resources uh, is owned by Stanford. Uh, but Stanford has one of the most progressive uh, tech transfer offices in the country. Um, generally, the path is that you can license it back uh, as an inventor uh, into a startup company. That's extremely common. Their terms are very generous. Uh, but occasionally, as, as was the case in our case, um, for some IP that they don't think is worthy of, of patenting themselves, they will just give it back to the innovator for free. Uh, so that, that is also possible uh, as well. Great. Um, I saw another question come in asking if you can apply with just a bachelor's degree and how to accentuate your application if that's the case. Um, so I'll answer that one. And if we have, I forget if any of our other um, alum applied with a bachelor's degree only, but um, that was my experience. So I applied with a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. And while it's certainly true that biodesign loves to bring in people that have MDs and PhDs and masters, um, they're also happy to recruit, recruit those with bachelor's degrees. And I think the important thing is if you have less academic experience in your application, you should really accentuate your industry experience. Um, and there's really no one profile in the fellowship. I think that's the beauty of it. Everyone is so unique from each other that there's plenty of space for all types of candidates and fellows. It's really just about showing why are you ready for the Biodesign Fellowship? Why is this a great time in your career to take a year off and learn the process? And I think if you tell that story in the application, um, that's the best way to do it. 
Um, another question that people are asking is more logistical, just on lifestyle. Where do fellows live? Does Biodesign provide housing? How does it work? Um, so if each person could share where they lived during fellowship, um, what the commute was like, some of those logistics that I'm sure Todd didn't cover as much, that would be great, starting with Jonathan. So I had already lived uh, in the area because I've been here for training, but I currently still live in Redwood City, which is just a little bit north of Palo Alto, maybe 15 minutes. Uh, it tends to be a little bit cheaper there for rent. It's still not reasonable compared to what most people are used to, but uh, there are a lot of housing options there and it's, it's still a nice place. Uh, I think um, trying to find a place in Palo Alto is pretty difficult, but it can be done. On, or housing is not provided by Biodesign, unfortunately. Rush, where did you live during fellowship? Uh, so I was uh, very lucky to get into a place called Stanford West, which is a faculty apartment complex uh, on campus. As soon as you get your acceptance letter to Biodesign put in to be on the wait list at Stanford West, it's subsidized uh, apartments for the university for faculty and staff. And as a postdoc, you count as staff. Um, and uh, it was about a five minute bike ride to and from Biodesign. And, and now I currently live in Mountain View. And Katie? So I was not as lucky to get into Stanford West, although I did apply. Um, but I lived in kind of the south end of Palo Alto, which is a little bit less expensive than living along University Avenue, um, but also still within Palo Alto. Um, and I was along El Camino Real, which has a bus line um, that can take you into Palo Alto. There's um, one of my team members who also lived around me, and she actually biked in. Um, and then I actually drove and paid for parking. But there are a lot of ways to get there. Sounds good. There have also been a couple of questions coming in about the externship phase of the fellowship, when people form their externships, how you find them. So could each of you share what your externship experience was, both what you ended up doing, but also what the process was like of finding a place to do your externship, um, starting with Rush. Uh, so I did my externship at a uh, ocular device incubator called Foresight Labs. Um, and the process essentially is talk to folks within the biodesign network and the externship shows up and people try to fit your experience with uh, opportunities available. People are very eager to have a biodesign fellow come for only a month. What did you do, Jonathan? So I worked at a startup uh, that works with imaging processing called HeartFlow. Uh, it's obviously a cardiology related company, so that was why I was interested in it. Uh, all, like, kind of like Rush mentioned, almost every startup around the area knows about biodesign and they're very happy to uh, have the fellows join them. And so it just took a couple emails and later in that week I was meeting with them and uh, a couple months later I was doing the internship. So. Sounds good. And what about you, Katie? So I did my externship at Abbott Vascular. Um, I had worked in smaller companies before and wanted to get some exposure to a larger company as well as making a more formal transition from engineering into more marketing. And um, so I had similar experience with, you know, with the uh, biodesign network. And you know, it's not just known by these small startups in the area, it's also known by most of the large companies as well. Um, and the fellows have kind of a unique place in the mind of large companies as they're trying to innovate more and more. Great. Um, so the next question was, were there any um, fellows whose backgrounds were more related with design um, from a design consulting firm, et cetera? And so I know in my year, we had at least one fellow named Ashley, and her background was all in industrial design. Um, and she focused her career prior to coming to biodesign on interaction design and usability design. And I think that's a really important point, which is that biodesign is not only looking for people with a specific mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, or biomedical engineering degree. Um, they're also interested in people with design backgrounds because our program is so inspired by design thinking. It really is an asset to have people with those skills in the fellowship. Um, everyone else, did you have anyone with more of a um, design thinking or background in your years? We, we didn't have a designer uh, our year, but a couple years before we had a patent attorney. 
That's interesting. I should have mentioned in my year, we also had someone from FDA and I know some previous classes have had people with regulatory background as well, which um, is wonderful. So we're always looking for people with business backgrounds, regulatory backgrounds to um, supplement the teams. Um, next couple of questions are on the same theme, which is what are job opportunities like after the fellowship? Somebody asked, how do you go about finding a job after biodesign? Is it easy to find a job? Are there a lot of opportunities? Um, Katie, can you share what your experience was like looking for a job post fellowship? Yeah, um, I would say, you know, it's always kind of challenging. I think the hardest thing about finding a job after biodesign is figuring out what it is you want to do, which is more kind of on the fellow than it's actually, um, you know, part of the process. Um, so I think for me, it was hardest to decide that I didn't want to start a company and that I did want to move into a larger company. I was debating between larger companies and smaller companies. Um, but once I kind of made that decision, um, Biodesign was able to make a lot of introductions um, to, to people. And for me, um, it is a bit of a challenge to move into, you know, out of engineering and into a more business background. Um, but especially if you look at something like upstream marketing, uh, the biodesign experience is pretty much the definition of strategic marketing. Um, and a lot of companies view that as, as very, very helpful. And then as far as, you know, startups tend to look at biodesign and say, um, it's, uh, it gives you kind of a background that um, makes people believe that you can do a lot of different things. Um, great, thank you. Um, what about you, Rush? Did you look for any jobs after a fellowship, or did you know you were going to go full speed with your startup? Uh, I'd say initially I knew I was going to go full speed, at least for the, the first year. Uh, but then after that, um, you know, one, one of the great things about the Biodesign Network is it's, it's so well respected across the industry. And I started doing some uh, consulting. Uh, just to supplement my income and uh, one thing's led to another and now I'm, I'm sort of teaching the biodesign process to uh, Fortune 500 medical technology companies uh, in the US and China, uh, Johnson & Johnson and, and Beckton Dickinson and a few others. Um, and so that's, that's sort of led to an expansion in the network and now folks are saying, hey, why don't you come you know, work, work with us? So, and it's, it's all really credit to biodesign uh, and the process that, uh, that you learn uh, along the way is, is by far the most valuable thing you'll get out of the program. Great, thank you. Um, there's a few questions looking for tips on how to succeed in the application process. One of the questions is, could we all go around and share our insights on the actual application process and the final interviews? How did you handle it? Um, what did the selection panel look like? And so while I know we don't want to share the, all the background details of what the interview is like, because some of that's to be discovered when you're here, um, if, uh, Jonathan, you can start by just sharing some of the best practices that you found were helpful during your own experience when you were interviewing, that would be great. Sure. So I think obviously the, the usual things, make sure you get it in on time and you follow the directions with the video and all that, you know, everyone can do that part of it. But uh, part of the program is to show you some creativity. So I think, you know, if you think you have an idea that is something that might show that side of you, they probably look favorably on that. Uh, another big part of it is showing that if you've worked on teams uh, in the past, I think that's it's a good thing to maybe highlight that in your application as well. What about you, Rush? Um, I, I'd say show a diversity of experience if you can in the application. Um, and as, as Jonathan echoed, um, you know, keep your video to the to the limit. Don't uh, don't go overly long. And similarly to all the other requirements in the application, that's that's really step one of uh, of making sure you get through the the basic filter. And then there really is no sort of secret thing other than um, just put your best foot forward. And if you don't make it to interviews. It might just be that you just don't have enough experience yet. Um, but if you do make it to interviews, you are qualified for the program. And even if you don't get accepted um, to the program, if you make it to interviews, um, it's, it's not a knock on you. It's just a, there's only so many spots. And the way that the teams form, uh, some years it's really tough for physicians because there's a lot of physicians that make it to interviews. And some years it's really tough for engineers. And um, it, it just sort of uh, take it year by year and some of the most successful fellows who have gone through the program and have now done companies and things afterwards 
uh, did not get in on even their first or, or second try, um, but, uh, but have been extremely successful. So uh, just keep at it and uh, um, you'll get in and have a great time. Thanks. Another question on the note of um, the videos is, first of all, someone's asking, how creative should you get with the video essay? And second of all, what are things that we should highlight in the video versus the written essay? Katie, can you share your thoughts? So I, I know the video essay, essay can be a little bit uh, daunting. I, I thought the video essay was a test. So what I did was I made sure that I did the entire two minutes in one take. Um, with an iPad, nothing fancy, um, because I thought I was being tested. Um, whereas I have seen um, other videos that other people have put together where they've spliced different things together, um, as well as, you know, maybe even had a kind of a cool background. So you can be either as boring as me and view it as a test or as creative as other people. Um, it's really just to get a little bit of a feel for the person and um, to how they kind of talk about themselves. Jonathan, what about you? Did you take Katie's approach or do you have uh, a different style for your video essay? Uh, kind of similarly, I think I, I probably, I mean, we don't really get to see each other's videos, so I, I'm not totally sure what everyone else does, but I took it pretty professionally. I took this as like a job interview. I dressed up for it uh, but and followed the directions pretty closely. But I do think if you want to be a little creative, they'd probably welcome that. <clears throat> Fresh, any other video tips? Uh, so one of the things I suggest after you get in the program is to watch everybody's video who's on your team. Um, you'll, you'll learn a lot about the person from that. Uh, in my case, I, I took a very heartfelt, sincere approach, uh, begging to get into the program. Uh, my other colleague on my team uh, did a parody on the most interesting man in the world as he sort of walked through the hospital and, and you know, had different uh, you know, Chuck Norris euphemisms. Uh, so it, it's it's really just to learn about your personality and the more professionally done um, from an artistic sense uh, is, is probably the way to go, whether or not it's it's uh, it's it's goal is just to communicate who you are and uh, why you would be a fun person to work with on the team and what are your skills. However you do that is is up to you. Sounds good. Thanks. Um, another question was how do we stay connected with innovators beyond the biodesign community? Of course, we have the strong network now of alum, but there are plenty of plenty innovators in Silicon Valley and throughout the world. So how do we stay connected with them? Um, what's your experience, Ben Rush? Um, I mean, it's, it's a small world out there in the medtech ecosystem. And uh, what you'll find is that a, a biodesign fellow will go to a big company or go to a startup and that, that, fellow will have team members who did not go through the program that will become their friends. And then when you go see them at a conference, you'll see the fellow and they'll introduce you to their colleagues at that new company or new startup. And it's, it's almost this just, you know, artificial network that forms uh, where you get to interact with and meet a lot of amazing people. Cause you know, the biodesign program is great, but it's, it's not the only way to be successful in the healthcare ecosystem. Um, so just, but having, having people come together for a very short amount of time and then scatter is, uh, is incredibly helpful. What about you, Katie? How do you stay involved with innovators who were not in biodesign? Um, yeah, uh, just like what Rush said, you know, everyone kind of comes from a previous company, you know, so you get an exposure to um, an additional network from there. So you would want to kind of keep up with the people you've worked with in the past, as well as, you know, I've gone to a number of companies um, since biodesign and met other great people there um, and have introduced them to other people who are involved in biodesign or somewhere else in my network. So it really just grows organically. Um, but it's, it's also kind of nice because people know biodesign kind of the way that they like know Harvard Business School or Stanford GSB or something within the med tech community. Um, so it, it provides a little bit of instant credibility, which is really quite nice. Somebody also asked about um, the summer extension program. Did any of the three of you do summer extension? I'm just getting started, but if anyone did the whole thing, it would be great to hear from you. Otherwise, I can share my experience so far. Uh, we did the, the summer extension, but um, I think our year was the last year where it was a six-month extension. 
Um, so we, we actually used that time to uh, run a 15 patient uh, IRB approved clinical study at Stanford. Um, so it was extremely valuable in getting uh, that clinical validation that ultimately led to the acquisition of the, of the AWARE company. Uh, and also it was nice to uh, give us a little bit more breathing room uh, to raise the funding for the, for the Vinca uh, company. Yeah, and so now I guess it's changed. A six-month extension sounds nice. Um, now it's a three-month extension. So towards the end of your fellowship at Biodesign, you can apply with your project to get an extra grant to stay for a few more months, which is what I'm currently doing. And so the summer extension takes us through the end of August, which really gives you a great period of time where you can focus only on your final project and try to bring it um, forward as much as you can and then start to look for other ways to keep it moving. Um, another question is, how geographically, geographically diverse are the fellows in the program? Um, and along with that, there's questions about, um, is it okay if my clinical experience was not in the US? And so I'll share the diversity of my class, and then we could each um, share if there's other experiences that you had with your teams. But I would say it's an extremely geographically diverse program. First of all, just in terms of the fellowship. Um, my team had a cardiologist who was originally from Israel, and he's actually going back to Israel to practice cardiology at the end of the fellowship. And I think, you know, biodesign attracts talent from all over the world. And so um, within the program, you'll certainly find international people. There also are a couple of global programs. And so from January through June, we had both the Biodesign Japan group as well as Biodesign Singapore, which gives everybody a chance to really understand the global medical device community. And I think it's a great asset of the program. Um, did the rest of you have any international fellows in your years? We had a fellow from Belgium uh, and also she had done some training in England and then one of the other fellows was originally from Canada but moved to biodesign from Switzerland. And we had a, a Canadian, an Israeli, and a Bulgarian. My year was mostly Americans. <laughs> um, somebody else also asking, how does a year of biodesign compare to a year in grad school? Um, so those of you that have been in grad school, can you chime in? It's a lot more like business school, uh, but you get to play with cool toys as opposed to a lot of PowerPoint presentations and things. Um, it, it's, it's, it's business school focused medical technology education. Um, it, it's, it's less lab work, but uh, I'd say infinitely more valuable than any of the time I spent during my PhD. Um, to that note, one of the questions that I saw come through right at the beginning was, what's the work-life balance like? How intense is the year? What are the hours like, et cetera? Um, Katie, can you comment on just the general um, pace of the year and how you found it? Uh, yeah, um, for me, I thought it was really good. It was kind of brisk, but um, that was what I liked about it. Um, and you, you kind of decide amongst your team how it is you guys want to work together. Um, my team tried not to meet on the weekends. Um, and then we also had one of our, um, one of my teammates had his daughter within the first month, uh, and it was his firstborn. Um, of biodesign and so we tried to work within his schedule um, but he liked to come in early so we would start early um, and then he wanted to be able to be home for dinner so we we made that happen um, so it's really just a discussion within your group um, so that you guys can accomplish what you want to during the year what about you Jonathan how did you find the pace compared to um, what you've done in cardiology uh, the one great part about it is it's you have total flexibility of your schedule, uh, kind of like Katie just mentioned. So if you need to meet early, you need to meet late. If you're, something happens one day and you, you can't make it, it's all usually pretty flexible and you can make it work. It's much less rigorous than my residency or fellowship training. <laughs> That's what I figured. And then Rush, anything else to add? Nope, uh, just work as hard as you want and the results will pay off or have fun and you, uh, you'll you also uh, have a great outcome out of the program. 
great. So I mentioned that my year we had someone from FDA, but not all years have that. So there was a question about, are there any interactions with FDA and with regulators during the program? Um, Jonathan, what was your experience with any interactions with FDA during the fellowship? Uh, so we didn't have anyone on our team that had a significant exposure with FDA and regulatory, but uh, we, because of that, um, during the kind of the role in parts of biodesign that they bring in people from the FDA and people that are experienced with that and we just connected with them maybe a little closer than we would with some of the other uh, advisors and they helped us through it. What about for you, Rush? Uh, so the FDA, they've had several advisors come in during boot camp, um, but uh, I be I'm trying to remember if it was our year or the year after they had um, either the commissioner or, or a high ranking uh, deputy commissioner come and actually speak to the program. So it's one of the benefits of the, the Stanford community is you get access to folks like that who are at the you know, uh, pinnacle of those types of organizations. Um, so it's, it's uh, uh, as much interaction as you want with the FDA, you can, you can find it. Sounds good, thanks. Um, another question is, how do future employers view you after the fellowship? Do they still define you by your core background, whether it was an MD, PhD, or do they, are they more interested in your whole spectrum of knowledge? So Katie, I know you've been speaking to that a bit, but can you just um, reiterate what your perspective is? Yeah, I think if they're familiar with the biodesign program, um, they tend to look at you as first being from the biodesign program, and then they look at kind of the second line of what your background was before that. Um, it, I think it, it does open a lot of doors to allow you to do different things because you're kind of seen as um, able to do more than kind of the typical person that comes out of engineering. Um, because you have that exposure to the clinical backgrounds, to innovation, and um, really kind of understanding the user experience a little bit more. Um, it's a really easy transition towards kind of strategic or upstream marketing um, and, and uh, prioritizing projects and all of that is exactly what you do in biodesign. Um, if you wanted to kind of jump a lot, um, then you would just try to get whatever experience um, you need within biodesign to make that jump. So I tried to take on a lot of the financial modeling um, for our, our group because I knew that I wanted to go and into a more business role, um, as well as some of the more business planning and thinking about the um, kind of launch strategies and stuff, even though they were relatively far out for the actual project. Um, that's something that I, I worked on to kind of build up my resume to be able to make that move. Great, thanks. Um, another question is about prototyping. Someone's wondering what happens if your team does not successfully develop a prototype and how do such fellows fare? And I think one of the amazing things about biodesign is there's skills that um, even if you've had no experience with it before, you'll find you're really able to master it through the fellowship and prototyping is one great example of that. Um, so Jonathan, can you share about your team's experience with prototyping? Did you find it challenging at first? And do you think it's even possible that a team could fail to create a prototype? Uh, in, in a word, no. I think the, they're very focused. Every Thursday, I, maybe it switched this year, Amanda, but I think it, we had it where every Thursday we would have meetings with pretty much all of the close advisors that we, uh, that we needed wherever we were in the process. Uh, and in, in particular, um, the prototyping part of it, the advisor is excellent. And I don't think you could ever get through biodesign without uh, come, overcoming that hurdle. Thanks. Um, another question for you, Jonathan, is um, there's a question, do you feel qualified to bring the innovation model to biodesign back at home? And could you envision yourself teaching this to residents? So how do you feel about that? Uh, definitely. I think uh, you spend the whole year focused on it. And so it, it really becomes kind of a way of life. And uh, I think pretty much every fellow would be able to explain the process to another person and teach it to them. I'd like to add on to that. One of uh, my team members actually is up at Oregon. And part of the reason um, why he was hired at that job was to be able to bring biodesign there um, as a clinician. Thanks, that's a great point. 
Um, another logistical question, people are wondering what are the deliverables at the end of biodesign? And so I think it would be interesting if each of you could comment on where your team was at the end of biodesign, because it's a little bit different each year and for each team. Um, Katie, starting with your team, what did you deliver on by the end? Um, so at the end of biodesign, uh, you kind of have a final project um, and you talk through a little bit of the process as well as you know, the projects that you ended up with at the end. Um, at the very beginning of the year, our team decided that what we wanted to produce at the end was one project that we could take as far as we, um, as we possibly could and potentially could get funding for it. Um, so we spent a lot of our time focused on having that deliverable. In some ways, you really set your own deliverables. Um, and we had someone who definitely wanted to start a company out of biodesign and we wanted to do as much as possible um, to, to have that come out of the program. Um, so we ended biodesign with um, some prototypes as well as um, a written protocol to be able to start an IRB study, um, much like Rush mentioned for his project. And Rush, where was your um, midpoint? What was the deliverable that you had reached by May during your fellowship year? Uh, so by May, we had uh, a couple of patients in for one clinical study, um, and we had a functional prototype that had received uh, feedback um, for the software product. And, you know, echoing what Katie said, it's, it's, you know, that's all fine and good. There were some teams that they just had a marketing and business plan. It's, it's really all about what your team wants. Uh, if you want to use the year for education to learn as much as you can about the different clinical areas available to you in the hospital, um, teams are allowed to do that. If you want to go as fast as you can on one or two projects to start a company, you can do that. It's, it's a really amazing opportunity to have that much flexibility in an academic program. Jonathan, where did your team um, end for your final project? Yeah, so when, at the end of the program, we had two competing functional prototypes and we were testing them in cadavers. And uh, then one of our team members continued with the summer extension. And, uh, went from there. So uh, I think with regard to the actual deliverable, kind of like Katie mentioned, everyone does the presentation, but you really do set your own end point. Uh, and some people come in knowing they want to start a company and that's where they go. Some people say, I want to learn the experience and then take it to somewhere else and do it again on my own. So it really just varies on what your team decides. Thanks. Um, Someone is asking, we've talked about a lot of career trajectories into medicine and industry and our own startups, um, but people are wondering, do any fellows go into venture capital following fellowship? Um, from your own years, do you have any peers that have gone into venture capital? Um, I, don't, I think a, a couple of people our year did uh, externships at VC funds and actually chose not to go into venture capital after doing those externships. I don't know if that's a good or bad thing, uh, but uh, the opportunities to go into venture capital are available um, if, you, uh, if you want them. Uh, but uh, if, if you think you want that path, definitely do an externship in that area. Yeah, and I would comment, um, I did an externship in venture capital, and so that is a very interesting opportunity to go into a field or practice that you wouldn't have otherwise done. I think there are some alum who are at least consulting or helping with um, venture capital at a part-time basis. Um, and I'm sure there's a couple, maybe from other years that we don't know that have gone into venture capital. So I think it is an option for those that are interested in going into that. Um, I think we have time for two more questions before we wrap up, just to let you know. So if anyone has any last questions that they wanna type in, now is the time. Um, I think one of the interesting topics is people are asking about how, you know, many of these projects are seen from a U.S. centric view. So what is biodesign doing to educate their fellows on global? Um, I would share, at least from my year, there was an increasing energy towards educating the current fellows on a global focus. And so to that end, we had different lectures throughout the year to represent um, different global markets, both in the developing world, as well as to help us better understand US and Europe. Um, and the externship period is also a good phase for people to um, go to another country if they want to and try to understand um, global medical device industries 
that way. But of course, it's a short period of time, which makes it challenging. But um, Katie, what was your experience as far as the global focus and your preparedness to take an idea global if you wanted to? Yeah, um, I think ultimately the project that we chose is a U.S. market first project, um, but that's just kind of how it shook out. Um, we did look at the global market opportunities for um, everything that we were looking at and um, kind of took that into consideration. You do your um, observation at Stanford and kind of in the Bay Area, so that does kind of give you um, a more local lean, but then you look at the opportunity as it could apply globally. Um, and then kind of to your point for the externship, um, my year had a number of people um, go do their externships, probably about half of them um, do a, a global externship. Um, and you could either do that uh, to go do whatever you want, but you can look at the global opportunity of your project. You could go um, actually do observation in another market if that's actually something that you want to do at that time. So they make it as available to you as possible and try to do as much global education as they can. Thanks. So um, we'll end with a last question about how we got outside of our comfort zones. Um, the question was, how often do we work outside of their zone of expertise compared to working within it? whether that's engineering, business, and medicine, um, and what was the breakdown throughout the year that you spent in your comfort zone, whatever that was, versus outside of it? Um, so Jonathan, if you could start, and then we'll have Rush, and then close with Katie, just reflecting on how much biodesign pushed you to move past what you came in um, as an expert in. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, that was one of my goals, was to try to learn the things outside my comfort zone. Uh, so I did try to spend a majority of the time there. Obviously there's parts where we're focused on clinical where that was all we did, but the breakdown is kind of, again, what you make of it. If you want to learn more in one area that you don't know about, then you can focus on that while you're there. So it's, it, it really is what you want. What was your experience, Rush? Uh, so coming into biodesign, I was really a biomaterial chemist. Uh, so I didn't really have any comfort zone that mapped to biodesign. Um, and now I'm working on a software company. So I'd say uh, uh, biodesign has really taught me that you can live outside of your comfort zone and still be successful if you apply the same principles that you learn in the program. <laughs> Thanks. And what about you, Katie? I'd probably echo what uh, Rush said. I probably came in as much more of a jack of all trades, master of none. So I don't think I had any mm -hmm. comfort zone. Um, and biodesign gave me a lot of opportunity to go deeper in the areas where, um, that I wanted to, and it gives you that flexibility to do what you want with it. Sounds good. Well, I think we're just about out of time. So to all those who are listening, thank you so much for taking the hour to hear our experiences, participate with your questions, and we hope that you um, learned about the fellowship. I know there's still always more questions. So as you continue to work on your applications, if you have any questions that weren't answered, please reach out to Emily, who's our fellowships manager, and she can either um, answer them or direct you to one of us to make sure that we can answer your questions. And we're glad that you're excited about biodesign and hope that this was a great hour to learn more and hope to see your applications come in at the end of August. All right, bye, thank you.